from Psalm 94, 17 to 19. And it is indeed an encapsulation of the good news, the gospel. Gospel, of course, literally means the good news. Part of that good news is that God loves us. And if I were to say just that and we call it a day and we go home, we would be quite lucky, would we not? God loves us. So I want to tell a story as I often do because uh, in years gone by, we made pretty good use of a local daycare in a different town uh, when our children were younger. And believe it or not, it was like a 45 minute round trip every day uh, for me or my wife. One way there and then off, drop them off, go to work, and then the same 45 minutes on the way back. So a lot of time in the car, but worth it. Since it was a really good environment with caring teachers, we knew the teachers pretty well, and we felt fortunate that we were able to partner with them during those early years, right? They helped us with the kids. And they had a lot of programs and activities scheduled each day, and the swimming pool was really close by. I don't even think there was a road that they had to walk across, right? They just went out the door and uh, down the sidewalk to the swimming pool. But like all schools and daycares, once an illness started, guess what? It was passed around, and then the children would bring it home to their families and so on and so forth. Now, this was way before any kind of COVID scare, okay? This was years ago. I'm talking here about the regular illnesses, stuffy noses, sore throats, and so on. So in other words, my wife and I, we were, we were sick a lot during those years, okay? I thought I was pretty healthy uh, before I got married and when we got married, but we didn't know yet about the little bugs that, that kids pass around. Now, in many respects, it's the body's way of building up a natural immunity. You bet. You get stronger over time. Each new exposure garners a stronger immune system, but boy, it isn't much fun in the meantime. And I remember one occasion in particular where we had been passing around a stomach bug back and forth at the house, as many parents did once it got started every year. And I think I was on my second round of it, and I sort of, I was uh, sitting on the bathroom floor with my my back pressed up uh, against the wall for support. My wife looks like she remembers this. And I was talking to her, this was a particularly bad one, folks. And I was talking to her and I felt myself begin to pass out. I was like, oh yeah, I'm not feeling too good. And she noticed this and thank goodness she was there. Uh, looking back, the problem I think was uh, dehydration, right? But at that moment, it wasn't that important. I only knew I needed help because I was fading in and out. So my wife takes pity on me. She notices this condition and decides that she's going to call in to work, okay, and tell him she can't come in uh, that day because she wanted to help nurse this guy sitting on the bathroom floor back to health, right? And there was a lot of pressure for her to get to work in those days because that particular job depended on each individual quite a bit. Um, but she called in anyway, and I'll never forget this moment because it demonstrated to me that when the chips were really down, when they were really down, she would always choose family. That day she chose me. Her love is all encompassing in that regard. And when I think about how much we need God's love in our life, especially when things go wrong or we're really sick, I am taken back to Psalm 94, verse 17 to 19. And I'll put it up on the screen for us. There it is. Unless the Lord had given me help, I would soon have dwelt in the silence of death. When I said, my foot is slipping, your unfailing love, Lord, supported me. When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought me joy. Now, the context of this situation, as it so often is, had to do with God avenging and protecting this psalmist against an external enemy. So much of the Old Testament scripture can be cast against the backdrop of an invading army or the threat of war or the threat of battle. Sometimes we forget that, but a lot of Old, Old uh, Testament scripture is really rooted and based in that, that type of fear and anxiety. Uh, the Assyrians are coming, help us, right? And so it seems like the Israelites were always in some kind of trouble always in some kind of trouble, some type of foe for whom without God in their corner, success, it wasn't going to happen. And so I want to focus for a minute on the part where the psalmist tells God that his foot is slipping. His foot is slipping. Because if we are honest, I think most of us can admit we have been in a similar situation where our foot's slipping. We need help. 
we have all felt oppressed at times. Maybe it's because we are worried about the pandemic. Maybe it's because of other things. My foot is slipping, we might say to ourselves or pray to God. Or maybe it's a fact that you're struggling with a marriage or a relationship in your life. You might tell the Lord that at this point in time, you can't necessarily see the light at the end of the tunnel. Your foot is slipping. You are losing traction. Now, it's difficult to hold on sometimes. Let's face it. And I have this picture of rock climbers. If any of you are rock climbers, I don't know. They have this place in uh, close to Des Moines and Grimes called Climb Iowa, I think it's called. And people literally, you, you click on a rope and you get up there and you climb and your fingers and your tensile hand strength is so strong, it's just incredible. Like if I were to do it, I'd get halfway up and the rope would be there. I'd just swing back and forth. That would be my, you know, that's, that, I'm that guy. But some people are so good at this, right? Their foot, they can keep it from slipping and they're hanging on for dear life almost. But sometimes we get in that situation and we can't hang on for much longer. Our foot is slipping, so we need help. I remember once years ago when I used to fill the pulpit uh, at different churches, I was scheduled to preach, and for one reason or another, usually I have an idea ahead of time, but I didn't this time. I had just a, a topic that I was supposed to speak on, and I wasn't confident about it. And I struggled with it, and I toiled with it, and reading didn't help, and talking to people didn't help, and I wasn't sure really what was going on. And so I remember praying the prayer, all right, God, I'm supposed to talk on this Sunday, and it's like four days away or three days away, need a little help here, can't even fake my way through it. So I'm driving around on this road trip, two-hour road trip, and I remember listening to the radio. I think it may have been AM radio at that point. I was listening to different broadcasts of sermons, and the sermon happened to be on my topic. Okay, Beautiful sermon. Listened to it. I was like, okay, good. That matches up with what I was kind of thinking. And then I flipped around in the stations, and there it was again. There was another sermon on that topic. So I listened to it. Drove a little bit farther down the road. Clicked around. There's the sermon again, different speaker, preaching the same thing. I was like, okay, God, I got it. I got it. God sent me help through the radio, through other press, other pastors preaching the sermon topic. At each turn, friends, we understand the same thing that the author of this psalm understood. God's love will never fail us. It will never fail us, even if everything else around us appears to. When we find that we cannot stand firm on our own, the Lord supports our feet. Now let's look further back now as we peer into one of the five books of Moses. This is Deuteronomy. This one's written a long time ago. I find myself quoting it a lot lately, however. Deuteronomy 7, 9. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. Now, guess what the backdrop here behind this scripture is? It's impending conflict and war. Okay, that's the backdrop again. Basically, God was instructing his people what to do if they were to end up in a war with an enemy army. In our own lives, you and I must contend not only with difficult situations in the physical world that can feel like we are at war, but the Bible says also we fight not against flesh and blood, but what? Against spiritual principalities, spiritual stuff. We are sometimes literally locked in a battle of good and evil, and it's easy to miss this. In this today's secular world, there is a spiritual side. There is a literal true good and literal evil. And those forces are at war. And to us, it can look like uh, this person is being mean to me and maybe that, that my boss isn't treating me very well and my car broke down and this, that, and the other. But really, sometimes what it is is we are locked in a spiritual battle. I remember several times when I would go to church to preach um, and I'd go out to my driveway and I'd have a flat tire or I'd do you know, this, that, and the other. We are locked in a spiritual battle. So the message here is simple. We are to know that God is faithful and trustworthy and that his love is long-lasting up to a thousand generations for those who love and obey him. 
Now, I think if we listen and we talk about these two revelations, we can make this point fairly well. God's love is relentless. I think we can draw that conclusion. We can run from it for a while, and I certainly did when I was younger. Didn't care much about church, didn't care much about pastors. Okay, used to make fun of the Methodist pastor down the street at my house. So sorry. <laughs> we can run, but you can't hide forever. You cannot hide from a relentless love or pretend it doesn't exist forever. God will find a way to let you know he loves you. Some days we may feel this love in a palpable way when everything's going right. And other times we may not sense it all. But make no mistake on those days when our feet are slipping, when we're trying to climb that rock wall, he is not aloof or unaware of what we're going through. He is not aloof or unaware. We do not serve in a personal God. We just don't. He's not like some vague spiritual being that can't be bothered with our problems because he's too busy or he's some generalized universal life force uh, or he's the current that runs through nature or something like that. You've heard all this, right? In fact, we have a God who cares about us deeply and is invested in our pain and suffering. If you don't think that's true, reread Isaiah 53. Reread Isaiah 53. That outlines the struggles that Jesus went through. I have a feeling that the world needs to know this kind of love right now. This love is patient, kind, compassionate, enduring. All the things that are most definitely lacking sometimes right now in the national news, for example, our country and other countries really in the world, we're going through some growing pains these last few years. Some may have forgotten that we are all children of the same God. Some may have forgotten that. I read recently in the newspaper, maybe it was on a website somewhere, that uh, there was a large group planning to um, uh, do a protest or a, or a meetup for uh, white supremacy and, and white power leaders. I think I read that right. We've forgotten we're children of God, created in his image and made for good works, designed for us ahead of time. We deserve respect and compassion from each other, not division. Now, many people today, many, it's easy to grab the concept an eye for an eye. Remember this one? That's Old Testament, an eye for an eye. But they forget how to remove the plank from their own eye first, prior to criticizing the speck in their neighbor's eye. That part gets lost somewhere in translation. It's a matter of godly perspective and not human pride or hubris. And I want to leave us with this passage also. From Hebrews 13 5 it says never will I leave you never will I forsake you never will I leave you never will I forsake you this is a promise we can count on we can count on it in fact if you take nothing else away from this sermon I hope you remember Hebrews 13 5 so back to me sitting on the bathroom floor propped up against the wall after I had recovered from that bout of the stomach bug, and I finally eventually did recover, of course, my wife, she starts showing symptoms herself. Only a matter of time. No doubt because she attended so closely to my well-being and to help me that the doctor had now become the patient. So it was my turn to do the cleaning, to cook dinner, and watch the kids while she rested. Love is funny that way. It prompts people to do what needs to be done without even necessarily always thinking of it. You just do it. It never forsakes or abandons its duty. It is relentless in pursuit of what is best for the other person, what is best for the object of its love. It is a lesson that needs to be put on display as much as possible today and wherever and whenever people are willing to listen. Scripture tells us that as time goes on, especially in the end days, the love of many will grow cold due to the increase of iniquity. The love of many will grow cold. Look around, people. Look around out in public when you travel, on the television, in the newspapers. 
The love of many will grow cold. But God is good, and he is just. He is pursuing us with an all-encompassing love that spans generations, even if it doesn't feel like it some days. And fortunately for us, the promises of the Bible do not depend on emotions or our day-to-day -day feelings necessarily, but rather they are based on God's own integrity. God said it, he'll do it. If we pray, he listens. If we love him, he loves us back. Indeed, I suspect he loves us even before we understand fully what that concept means. In fact, I know he does. So on Grandparents' Day today, on this special day, those of us who are grandparents or parents know the importance of those special relationships. We help guide and influence those little ones. And they look to us for understanding and joy. So I ask today that we do the same for our God. We look to him for his relentless love, his guidance, his joy. The kind that you can't get anywhere else. You can't get it outside someplace else. The kind that the rest of the world so desperately needs and seeks. Will you pray with me? Lord God, your love is relentless. It spans generations and tribes. We pray, Lord, for the courage today to be able to show this type of reckless, relentless love to the rest of the world. We pray you listen, and when you respond, we receive. In Jesus' name, amen.